2020. So that means a virtual Freedom Award tribute. For the past 28 years, we have brought civil and human rights heroes and sheroes to Memphis, Tennessee to highlight their courage, patience, commitment, and persistence in fighting for, encouraging, and creating positive social change, moving us closer and closer to real freedom and justice. We've had the opportunity to give so many of these great human beings their flowers while they were living. Some have received those bouquets after they fought their battles, others while they were in the middle of their work. But each of them has been very worthy individuals who have made a mark on civil and human rights issues around the globe. Our honorees have included those who were very familiar mothers and fathers of the civil rights movement, like Coretta Scott King, Rosa Parks, Diane Nash, James Lawson, John Lewis, and Andrew Young. They have also been global human rights activists like President Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama, and President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. We've also brought celebrities who have contributed to the cause of social justice like John Legend, Ava DuVernay, Oprah Winfrey, and Magic Johnson. While Freedom Award is primarily about those individuals, we can't forget about the great entertainment, the singers, musicians, spoken word artists, and our MCs that always bring their own style and interpretation to the event. There are far too many to name, but like me, if you've attended even one award ceremony, you probably have a favorite honoree or moment that comes to mind. If you've never attended, have we got a treat for you. Although this year we could not get together, walk the red carpet in our finest outfits and share a drink and a few hors d'oeuvres, we invite you to join us this evening as we take a virtual journey through the past and lean into the future in preparation for our 30th anniversary in 2021. Tonight, we walk down memory lane and revisit some of the very best moments of the past 28 Freedom Award events, including our student forum that precedes the Freedom Award ceremony. So get comfortable, grab a special beverage and a bite to eat, and let the National Civil Rights Museum get your 2020 holiday season started. Enjoy the show. Some days for 14 hours And you can bear 
On December 1st, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, this lady was put behind bars. On July 4th, 1991, in Memphis, Tennessee, we say thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Rosa Parks. This is truly a great day here at this museum. I can recall when I learned of Dr. King being shot, how hurt I was. I became physically ill just to think about this tragedy. But today I'm very happy and proud to be here and to be a part of the opening of this museum. We need to continue to work for civil rights because there are some values which are core values. There are some things we believe in which we will stick by to the death. And they are things like freedom. Freedom is core. We can't compromise on freedom. There, own, there are no gradations of freedom. There is not a first tier and a minor tier of freedom. Freedom is freedom is freedom. And friends, tell them that when we struggle against racism, when we say we are fighting for freedom, it is not freedom for black people, it is freedom for all of us. And Martin Luther King's dream at the March on Washington was pronounced in spite of the fact that he said America had presented the Negro with a bad check. And that he refused to believe that when we presented this promissory note before the Bank of Justice in this great nation, he refused to believe that it would come back marked insufficient funds or insufficient justice. And it was in spite of the fact that he got the bad check back. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin. Let there be peace on earth, a peace that was meant to be. in Harlem and he unfolded for me his concerns about our nation 
and our people. I understood at the end of our four-hour exchange that I would become inextricably bound to the cause of ending legal segregation in this country and move for the betterment of all the people of our nation. I came with doubt. I came with question. But my doubts were no more than his and many others. But in each other we found strength. And in the way the American people began to respond to our cause, you were able to feel great faith in this nation's ability to change the wrong. For a South African to be honored here tonight in this place and by this body, inspired as it reminds us again of the indivisibility of human freedom, where the freedom and rights of people in one part of the world are violated. We are all demeaned and diminished as humans. Our freedom cannot be complete while others in the world are not free. Your award inspires us to continue the struggle for freedom and human rights. It reminds us that the long walk to freedom is not yet over. Sometimes it's very, very difficult to look at progress, to look improve in the future. Because uh, 10 years ago, I say, in 10 years, maybe the humanity have different history. Uh, maybe the humanity to take a new perspective. But now you look same uh, situation. Our struggle against impunity is the same. Our struggle against racism is very important. It's the same. Our struggle for the peace is the same, for the justice. And uh, I think it's very important to make these kind of activities because uh, we need to make one agenda, one uh, schedule for the future. Thank you very much. Gracias, gracias, gracias. When you walk through the museum and you see this wall of faces of people who've received this award previous to tonight, it's really daunting, it's humbling, and you know that I'm in high cotton now. But uh, I want to accept this award in the name of the anonymous women and men who made the movement. The people with tired feet, the protesters who were beaten back, the people who wouldn't turn back. It was they who inspired me, who made me know that ordinary women and men could create extraordinary cha change. Dr. King was killed by a man who hated his politics of a different race. Bobby Kennedy was killed by a young Arab who hated his politics because he thought he was his enemy because he believed Israel had a right to a home in the Holy Land. On the darkest day of my presidency, personally, my great friend Itzhak Rabin was murdered by a young Israeli Jew who believed he was a bad Jew and a bad Israeli because he wanted those Palestinian kids to have a homeland and a place to grow up and a life. And he thought Israel would only be secure if they could share the future. So we've been fighting about this kind of stuff everywhere for a long time. Use this museum, use your life, use your wisdom, use your heroes. Try to get people from all around the world to see this and to see that if we did it here after hundreds of years of oppression, 
And if Mandela can walk out of his jail after 27 years and forgive the people who brutalized him, that this can be a model for all these other religious and tribal and whatever conflicts. And try to remember that the only way we can ever keep making it a model is if we follow what our founders told us to do, to make a more perfect union. The National Civil Rights Museum every day helps to make America a more perfect union. Thank you, and God bless you. I tasted the bitter fruits of racial discrimination, and I didn't like it. So like hundreds and thousands of others, I got involved. Blacks and white, rich and poor, we got involved. We got in the way, we got in trouble. When I was growing up in Alabama, my mother and father would tell me not to get in trouble. Don't get into trouble, they would say, but I got in trouble. It was good trouble, it was necessary trouble, and I was not the only one getting into trouble. During the 60s. So tonight, in a step in this award, I said, call it a house for Memphis. Call it a house of Tennessee. Call it a house of Atlanta, the house of Georgia. Call it a house of Washington. Call it a house of New York. We all live in the same house. Call it a house of Ireland. Call it a house of Africa. We all live in the same house. For we are one house, we are one people, we are one family. So tonight I say to each and every one of you, walk with the wind and let the spirit of freedom, justice, and liberty be our guide. Just maybe our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships. Tonight we're all in the same boat. It doesn't matter whether we are black or white or Hispanic or Asian American or Native American. We are one people, we are one family, we are one house. Thank you very much for this great honor. My name is Bono and like the video says, I, I am a rock star. They gave me this incredible tour. They let me stand on the consecrated ground today and uh, it's just a very very big honor uh, to be on stage with John Lewis and we were looking for somebody like Do Dr. King a black reverend who refused to hate because he thought loved showed a better way I walked through the Lorraine Hotel the museum today this was my first visit and I consider it a uh, a gift to be in the place where Dr. King's spirit ascended from. I consider it to be a gift of empowerment and strength and courage and spirituality to be able to walk the halls of the Civil Rights Museum and see the faces and hear the voices of those who made my life and our lives possible. I owe them a lot. When you do your best, when you are your best. And that is what you owe. You owe every person who gave up their spirit. Young people, make sure you dream big. Uh, you know, Deidre, you and I are the youngest MCs ever to invited to host a public forum. Uh, you ready for this? <laughs> I was born ready for this, okay? What advice do you want to give students who want to make a change, but they do not know where to start? That your generation 
uh, would understand that there was more to what my dad and my mom and those in the movement did than marching and protesting and demonstrating. There were things that took place behind the scenes in terms of teaching and educating and training and strategizing that gave context to the marches and the demonstrations. Think about what angers you, what makes you passionate. Think about what affects you and your family or someone in com your community that you feel some passion about. Show them the palms of your hands because maybe because your palms are white, it will remind the shooter that you are just like them. Say, I am, I am. Somebody. somebody. I am, I am. Somebody. somebody. A young couple asked me, when did this thing get started? About the origin of the movement. And of course, all people, including black people, are born with a sense of freedom. So when in another era, a Dr. Stanley in search of Dr. Livingston went to West Africa, he found bones buried in the sandy shores of that continent belonging to our ancestors who, who died on those sandy shores, resisting being taken in chains on ships through a dark passage to a world of slavery. That was the beginning of the freedom movement on the continent. And they were saying as they died there, what, their, what the surviving descendants said here in this country in a spiritual, before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave, go home to my God and be free. I just come. As I said earlier today, I do not want to come here to Memphis and speak to such a distinguished group without doing some business. I need your help. I need your help. We face an emergency. And on Main Street and Wall Street and Beale Street, we need men and women of character who are devoted to truth and who care about those who come after us to look this squarely in the eye. I need your help. We need to solve this climate crisis. It is dangerous, but it is the greatest opportunity that we have ever confronted.
like the one someone really cares guess who see now if I could do like Miss Hill and Miss Adams I would say so open open your heart oh then surely you'll see five that that someone for who really cares there's someone who really cares is me music I had two feelings one feeling sad I saw such a person wonderful really totally dedicated well-being of other particularly dedicated for less privileged people or suffer through generations uh, he fight for that and finally he came it's sad but another feeling no matter how much obstacle but struggle or just a struggle struggle for right for freedom today after being at the civil rights museum the same thing that the dalai lama said i felt two things i felt sad and i also felt very strong because i know that is what i come from Too much hypocrisy in this old southern town for me. Way back in 1619 began this tragic story. Thrown into slavery's den, the crime was the color of skin. Never to see the light of the past again. And I want to go where the mountains are high enough to echo my song. I want to go where the rivers run deep enough to drown my shame. I want to go where the stars shine bright enough to show me the way. I want to go where the wind calls my name. The wind is calling India, India, India. My friends, we are blessed. Let's not forget it. And let's continue to give to each other, to our communities, our country, and this world. My grandmother said, baby, come back. You haven't finished your prayers. And as a child, I would wonder, what now? What didn't I say? And come back and get on her knees. She said, you didn't ask God to make you a blessing. And I would say, God, make me a blessing. Get up and go on about my business. And over the years, over the years, that became a pattern. I finally realized the essence of being a blessing. I stand before you tonight thanking you so much for this honor but as you honor me you honor yourselves and at a proud 76 years of having lived and seen so much in change I still say thank you and I ask God to continue to make me a blessing thank you We have a freedom that's unparalleled in the world, and we have that freedom. We have a... We have a freedom because all the sacrifices that have been made for us. And, and that's why this month is so special for me, because I'm physically touching 
you know, people who, who were there and uh, the results of their work, they're actually getting a chance to, to experience firsthand. And the ones who made the greatest sacrifices, uh, Edgar Evers and uh, Dr. King and, uh, and so many others, uh, so many others who, you know, just took a lot of beatings, so many others who, who rearranged their, their lives because civil rights struggle became their it. And you're looking at an individual who is, once again, uh, very humbled by the opportunity, the honor, the recognition. I, I know Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, whose words I heard give narration uh, to my video. I thank them in, in absentia. And uh, I know that whoever's next uh, will be worthy because uh, the uh, curators and the organizers of National Civil Rights Museum has only looked for the best examples to give this Freedom Award to. So thank you for elevating my status and helping to make my life and my legacy complete. Thank you and God bless you. For the past 20 years, the National Civil Rights Museum has connected people and history. From honoring President Nelson Mandela, to the Dalai Lama, to Oprah Winfrey, to Rosa Parks. All of these outstanding honorees have a common goal of continuing the legacy that has been put before us by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Yes. And that legacy is pure and simple. Make a difference. Uplift your brothers and sisters and seek a colorblind solution to problems that are colorless, such as poverty, injustice, and inequality. It is only when we look past our differences to those qualities that connect us as human beings can we move ahead as a nation. So tonight, we honor men and women who have done just that. They looked the challenges squarely in the eyes, and they didn't back down, and I, for one, am so glad that they didn't. As I stand here strong and firm, and I humbly say, thank you. Stays the same Everyone will change No one stays the same give them this space, all human beings will be as tall as any other human being. 
And I keep repeating, poverty should not belong to any civilized society. Poverty should belong to museum. That's where poverty should be. Nobody in the world should remain a poor person. We can do that. All we have to do is to look back and look at the system where it goes wrong and fix it. Thank you very much. You. What you've done here, which you don't know, you've restored my soul. And that's why my cup is about to run over. And as I walked, what I didn't realize is that you were watching me. I didn't know you were behind me, watching me, following me. And that brings true that goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. I want to thank you for restoring my soul. You know, my brother and sister and I never ever intended to carry the torch of St. Jude. In fact, my father had been quite clear to us that this was his promise and that the work of the hospital would not be our burden to carry once he was gone. Which, of course, was psychologically brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, too, that my father would join me in thanking the National Civil Rights Museum for all that you do. How moving and fitting that you have transformed the Lorraine Motel, a place of such deep sadness 44 years ago, into an inspiring destination so that all may pay tribute to the triumph of Dr. King's vision. So on behalf of the Thomas family, on behalf of our St. Jude family, and on behalf of all the children and their moms and dads, thank you for this wonderful honor. God bless you, and God bless your good hearts. Thank you. Over the rainbow way up high, there's a land that I've heard of once in a lullaby. Over the rainbow, then why, oh why can't I? Someday I wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind.
our kids have been failing for generations and no one has done anything except we have decided, we have decided that when these kids fail, and we know they're going to fail, our responsibility as a nation is to build enough jails so we can house all of the failures in this country. There is something un-American about thinking about your children that way. And in this country, we should be ashamed. We lock up more people per capita than any place on the first of the earth. 744 people per 100,000 and nobody's even close to us. You just whip out your phones, you punch in incarceration rates. Number one in the world is the United States. Why have we allowed our young people our young people to be destroyed at such record numbers and we've done nothing about it. That is not the America Dr. King dreamed about. I decided to study law and I was doing my homework in August 1963 preparing to go up to law school in Trinity in Dublin in September and I heard a speech that moved me beyond belief as it moved many, many in this audience and millions and millions around the world and still does. And this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of that speech. And I understood why I wanted to study law. I wanted to study law because law would be an instrument of social change, an instrument of justice. And I spent four years studying law in Trinity and then I had the good fortune to get a fellowship to Harvard Law School to take a master's degree. And I was the class of 1968. If you take the fruit of the civil rights movement for granted, the right to vote, equal access to education, jobs and business opportunities, they may very well rot and spoil depriving future generations of what you take as an entitlement. I am personally challenging you I'm, I'm speaking of the younger people in the audience now, and I'm assuming everyone else has a very solid job. I'm, <laughs> it's that bad, huh? I, I personally am challenging you to, not to allow that to happen. We entrust our dreams and Dr. King's dreams to you so that you might advance the principles of freedom, justice, and opportunity well into this century, paving the way and leaving a legacy for those who will follow you. In conclusion, on behalf of Black Enterprise and the Grace family, I thank you for this great recognition. I come from a profession that is not known for its humility. To be in the company, however, of these people that you have been honoring here tonight is just a little bit like being Barry Manilow at a Jay-Z concert. <laughs> I am wondering how I got here, but, uh, <laughs> but in fact, this is a common cause that knows no pigmentation line. There are no racial lines when it comes to human rights and the promise of equality for citizens in this country. To fulfill that promise has been a long journey and it is not yet over. I thank you for helping us to build a proud legacy. I was simply your vessel. So may God bless and keep you and guide my successor to even greater heights. Thank you so much for your support, your love, and for all you have done to help create a world-class National Civil Rights Museum right here in Memphis, Tennessee. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Terry Lee Freeman, President of the National Civil Rights Museum. Good evening, and thank you, Beverly. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be in this servant leadership role, to have the awesome responsibility of stewarding the future of this great institution and national treasure. Yes, it's true, there's some things I don't want to say. But I still need love, cause I'm just a man. My life 
never seems to know the plan I don't want you to leave, won't you hold my hand So won't you stay with me Cause you're all I need This sees love is plain to see So won't you stay with me Why am I so emotional? They say it's not good some self-control Deep down I need this thing to learn I don't want you to leave so it doesn't hurt So won't you stay with me Cause you're Tonight we celebrate. Tomorrow we pursue our mission to make sure no one ever forgets. We will continue to examine where we came from and how far we've come, who we are and who we hope to be. We are immersed in this very important movement. She passed their test so that they had no more excuses. See, what they meant for evil, God meant for the development of her future. Little soldier, left, right, left. March her dainty little feet on the battlefield of racism. The mere value of her presence yielded this important lesson. Racism is a grown-up's disease, and we should stop using our children to spread it but instill into them the value of love, education, and the premise that every race is worthy of being accepted. As I walked through the museum, and before I knew it, I was in the space where Dr. King was. And I looked out onto the balcony, and I felt like I saw what he saw. It was something that I will never forget. So to be honored here tonight in this manner, I cannot begin to tell you. I feel like I've found my rightful place in history, and you all have given that to me, and I thank you so, so very much. So my charge to you would be to think, what can you do? It doesn't have to be the front lines. Well, you all are here tonight, so you've done a bit. But to inspire others to see that you don't have to be on the front lines, but you do have to do something to make the world a better place. I saw a poster last year in Mississippi, not where you'd expect it, and it said, y'all means all. Yes, we are all God's children, and we are all created in the image of God, or so we're told. And most of us believe it. And I don't see where it says that God is white or black or Asian or Hindu or Buddhist or Christian or Muslim or straight or gay. We're all created in the image of God. Y'all means all. Let's hold that thought and go forth and make it reality. Thank you. The museum uh, that I toured this afternoon was um, jaw-dropping to me um, in its beautiful display of the magnificence and the majesty of black people. Um, I thought that it was uh, just a beautiful overview of, of both tragedy and triumph. And uh, I was allowed to go out onto the balcony 
no words. It, it just happened about an hour ago, and I'm still a little shaken up. But just to have that place, that space preserved in this way is, uh, is something to celebrate. And so I thank the museum so much uh, for existing and for honoring me here tonight. Uh, from the plane to this moment, um, this my time here at, in Memphis has been really extraordinary. It's been one of the most beautifully organized experiences I've, I've had. Um, really, you guys do it really nice here in Memphis. I really like it. It was one particular day, and I was really, really upset and just challenged by what was going on, and my producer, Oprah Winfrey, was nearby. It's nice to have her nearby. And uh, I remember saying, oh, why is this happening to me? Now, why is this happening? We were just about to get the shot, and why did this happen? And she said in her Oprah-like voice, something that really changed my life, um, and I've really abided by for the last two years. She said, Ava, <clears throat> this is not happening to you. It's happening for you. The decades-long struggle of local people like Amelia Boynton made it possible. The sacrifice of martyrs Jimmy Lee Jackson and Reverend James Reeb made it possible. The courage of student organizers like Bernard and Kalia Lafayette made it possible. The commitment of clergy like Reverend Clark Olson made it possible. The vision of activists like James Bevel and Diane Nash made it possible. The political will of President uh, Lyndon Johnson made it possible. And the inspirational leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr made it possible. But despite the troubling legacy of Jim Crow that we still live with today, we as a people and we as a nation are in a far better place today than we were yesterday. And it's because of Selma. But if we want to be in a better place tomorrow than we find ourselves in today, then we need another Selma. That time has come again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to be back, especially for such an important occasion. Happy 25th anniversary to the National Civil Rights Museum. You started it all and set the record straight that the civil rights movement was one of the most significant and successful social movements in American history. We know the struggle is still real. We are living it every day. That's why we got to protect our kids and protect our families and protect our bodies and protect American democracy. Stop killing us, learn to love us, embrace us as human beings on the road with you. For this 25th Freedom Award and justice for all is the theme. Justice for all is something we should all take seriously. Not justice for folks who look like you or pray like you or love like you or live like you, justice for everybody. That's what we're dealing with tonight. That's the dealio, that's the real deal, Holyfield, that's what we're doing. Falling back on that what, what the heck of I, gangster lean, getting funky on the mic like an old batch of collard greens. <clears throat> Fighting for justice is their calling. You'll hear their stories and then you'll think to yourself, I need to get busy. I ain't working hard enough. Believe me, there's plenty to do, but these honorees are definitely making their mark. They make me want to go out and free somebody. Free somebody. Free somebody. I'm thrilled to be in this place. I'm thrilled to accept this award. I had some time in the museum this afternoon, which was deeply meaningful to me, and it just reminded me of something painful but something necessary to say. And what I have to say is that we are still not free in this country. We are not. We are burdened by our history of racial inequality. Our history of racial inequality has created a kind of smog. And we've all been breathing it in, and we're not free. And there's work to do if we want to get free. If we want to get free, we've got to talk about some things we haven't talked about. We've got to talk about the fact that we are a post-genocidal society. There was a genocide on this continent. When white settlers came, there were millions of indigenous people, native people, who were living here, and we killed them by the millions. We slaughtered them through famine and war and disease. 
We didn't own up to that. We didn't say that to genocide. We said, no, those people are a different race. And we use this narrative of racial difference to justify our conduct. And that same narrative of racial difference was then used to create slavery, centuries of enslavement. And I don't think the great evil of American slavery was involuntary servitude or forced labor. I believe the great evil of American slavery was the narrative of racial difference that we created in this country, the ideology of white supremacy that we made up to legitimate slavery. So I come from humble beginnings. People think that only certain people can talk about injustice. People think, also think that women shouldn't have a place at the table. Well, the last time I checked, the, the most diverse companies, the most diverse boards, the, the most diverse anything that have women involved, you seem to be doing all right. What a tremendous honor, and thank you to the National Civil Rights Museum for the tour this afternoon. It was amazing, and it is beautiful, and it is hard, because as you walk through, you really realize just how far we are from justice for all. We're far. We're not close. But it also inspires, I think, anyone who walks through to recognize that we must be part of the solution. We have to. And so I am especially grateful for this award tonight because it's great, if not a little unnerving, to be honored for one's work. Um, but more importantly, I think it says that what you're doing day to day is important. It does matter, even if maybe people around you don't necessarily think so. Um, and it's not just for historic value. Um, it's that the work is relevant today, that all those things as you walk through the Civil Rights Museum, it's not just, hey, this happened in history. It's that it matters today. It's part of a continuum of what we're dealing with and fighting with and talking about and exploring and digging into today. It's relevant. I regard this museum as a national shrine from which we gain a special inspiration, a sense of duty and obligation, and a recognition of our kinship with each other. It is here that we are able to learn to embrace the better angels of our nature as Abraham Lincoln admonished us to do. It is here that all of us, and especially our young people, can be informed of what is important in our lives and can be motivated to live up to our duty to build a better and a more compassionate and more caring society. I'm so proud to be here. I'm so proud, I'm so honored to have this a very important prize for me as Tawakkul, for me as women, for me as youth, for me as Yemeni, for me as Arab youth activist, for me as a human who, are, who is looking for freedom, dignity, equality, democracy, peace, love, and rule of law. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is an honor for me to stand on this stage and uh, represent the old man, uh, the one and only Mr. Hugh Masekela. I would not be here without him. Some of you might know um, my father is recovering from prostate cancer at this time, and he is, uh, he's in a fight. But I spoke to him today. This is the first game my father's ever missed in his entire 60-plus years of making music and being an activist. My dear sisters and brothers, I regret so deeply that I can't be with you tonight to receive this prestigious award that you have so graciously bestowed upon me. My son Salima will be there to receive it on my behalf. Again, thank you very much. This is the city 
that 49 years ago took something from me and my siblings and my mother. And so tonight, I am overwhelmed that the National Civil Rights Museum, the location of where my father was taken from us, is giving something back to me. God bless you. And I receive this in honor of the woman who is responsible for who I am through and through, my mother, Mrs. Coretta Scott King. I say all the time that when my father was assassinated, he was one of the most hated men in America. Friends turned their back on him because he chose not to segregate his conscience when he spoke out against the war in Vietnam because of how it was undermining the work of addressing critical social issues here in our country, especially as it related to poverty, which to this day, this nation still has refused to deal with. Ladies and gentlemen, we present the 1968 Sanitation Workers. Baxter Leach, presented by Terry Freeman. H.P. Crockett, presented by Emily Yellen. Odell Ewell, presented by Rosie Bingham, daughter of 1968 sanitation worker Jake Phillips. Elmore Nickelberry, presented by Herb Hilliard, NCRM Board of Directors. And Reverend Leslie Moore, presented by Payam Sahihi, Ford Motor Company. Black folks wouldn't have any luck at all. 
All they left us with was the blues, y'all, in 1968, and now they say they want that too. It must be something about it then, huh? All this black on us, all this shadow and act, this earth and tone, this boom shakalaka, this hoochie coochie, this chakra, this gravel between my nails, this oil slick for a throat to lump a coal for a heart beating like a tired diamond, all this black cat under a ladder on Friday the 13th, this soot they got all over my soul, they stole my onk and put this Adam apple in my mouth, killed our black leaders, and then left us this drunk Noah, saying he gonna love that animal going two by two, but they love these Negroes with a four by four, said swing, batter, batter, swing, be all this satchel in my satchel, this Josephina, my Jimi Hendrix, Nina, singing slaves to safety, Santa Maria, pizza, all them fancy names, but I can't sleep without sirens singing me to sleep. Don't even flinch at the sound of gunshots anymore, like that's a compliment. It must be all this magnificence masquerading as man tan, all this cotton in my club, all this shoe fly and two step in my shoes. I tried to hide it, y'all. What parts they didn't beat out of me. But just as soon as I think shoulder slump savvy, shuffle step spectacular, coon eyes lit, I slip up and let amazing fall out my mouth. Start speaking in Holy Ghost tongues, saying crazy things like, uh, Oprah, Serena, Beyonce, Sandra, say her name, Solange, Sizzle, Abba, DuVernay, Issa Rae, Michelle, OBA, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves some fool for getting his neck snapped by me. See, I once was Kanye, but now I'm Kanye. Was Jigga, but now I'm Jay-Z. See, I keep messing up in front of them, y'all forgetting my place. Must be all this black that refuses to be anything but beautiful. All this Shirelles and Patti LaBelle, all your whole get to the encore, and this Aretha Franklin all claim. All this James Brown private plane screaming, I'm going to take you higher. See, I told Teddy and Curtis staff at Mayfield, I told Teddy, don't pin too much grass. I warned Marvin that the world couldn't handle a black man that gay. As in happy, as in feels the joy the world didn't give so the world couldn't take away. As in mercy, mercy me, I tried to play the role of trouble man, y'all, I swear I did. But see, my mama, she tattooed Malcolm on one fist and Martin on the other. Named her belt Mahalia and God for me in the religion of butt whooping revivals. <laughs> Said I was born a, a dollar short <laughs> and a day late. <laughs> so squash tomatoes, baby, catch up. Must be all this I, my ancestors, wildest dreams in my eyes, all this harambe in my hips, all this Avon Ailey in my gate, and this Kooji Chocolate in my kickstep that won't let me play, kid. They say it must be bad luck to be born this black and still proud. I say, yeah, there I go again. But this bad black luck is certainly better than no luck at all. In 1960 what? 1960 who? 1960 what? 1960 who? 1960. Hey, these cities are burning. 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 I've been thinking about this place, about where we are, and that this is a place where we may have lost a king, but we found our soul. And Reverend Jackson today said that this is Calvary, that Memphis is the place where the American soul found itself. Our heart was broken, but something really important happened here. And so I said to you tonight, don't give, up, don't give up and don't go where we're well doing. There is still yet a great kingdom to go open. To, every time I think about the balcony in, in Memphis and Lorraine, the balcony in Lorraine, the balcony at the White House 40 years later. Dr. King crucified on the balcony here, and, and Barack and Biden resurrected on the balcony of the Potomac in Washington, D.C. We, we become so used to black president, we expect another one. We shared a passion for education and a belief that every child, regardless of where they live, the color of their skin, or the income of their parents, deserved a quality education. I was taught in my family that one of the great benefits of being successful in business is to have the opportunity to give back to the community in a meaningful way. Through the lens of the civil rights movement, I can state with conviction 
that every, even today, 54 years after Brown versus the Board of Education, access to quality education for every child remains the civil rights issue of our time. On the 17th of January, carrying a black man who was about to pick me up, and we were jointly going to take a 124-mile ride to Washington, D.C., to be sworn in as President and Vice President of the United States of America. It hit me like a thunderbolt. So don't tell me we have to accept where we are. Don't tell me things won't change. Don't tell me that we can't restore hope in this country. Don't tell me that anything is beyond our capability. This is America. We've done it before, and it's time to do it again. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for this great honor. I was around eight or nine. My dad asked me to sing that day. Had he have not been a minister, he could very well have been a great singer. I really didn't want to sing, but he heard the possibilities and he continued to encourage me to sing. And thank God he did.
Thank you, National Civil Rights Museum. I salute you for the work you're doing to raise our consciousness about the issues that continue to impact our lives and honoring those men and women who excel in the fight for freedom. You keep us informed. You encourage us to act. I know I want to do better. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank you. And I want to thank you again. to see I want them to see it I want them to see it because this is really for them this is really for them it's really for all the people who have done as they did to fight for freedom and to give their very lives so that we can live in a freer society and with more dignity I want you to know that we on the continent of Africa, we feel every pain, we feel every suffering, we feel your every struggle, we celebrate your every success, we stand with you in solidarity as family. We want to be with you, we want to reconnect with you, we want you to know that your lives matter to us. So I just want to suggest to you that there is a deep, deep measure of freedom available to us, and that is laughter. Never go any place where they won't let you laugh. <laughs> this is a high point of my life. I am so grateful to you. I promise, promise, I will do my best to live up to this award and my two glorious co-awardees, and I look forward to a time when we are all free and we laugh. I'm tired, I'm weak, I am all
It is truly humbling to be here tonight to join this incredible list of Freedom Award recipients. It reminds me that I have a lot of work to do to live up to this honor. Thank you for bringing me to the National Civil Rights Museum today. In a world that seems to move from one passing trifle to another, a world that revels in forgetfulness, that blissfully tries to ignore the past or whitewash it of its sins, you refuse to let us forget the darkness of the tragedy that birthed this museum. You righteously remind us of the anger, the shock, the numbness. Thank you for creating a memorial that channels that pain into a place of hope, of education, and resolve. It goes hands to the heavens, no man or no weapons Formed against, yes, glorious destined Every day women and men become legends Sins that go against our skin become blessings The movement is a rhythm to us Freedom is like religion to us, yeah Justice is juxtaposition in us Justice for all, just stay specific enough One son died, the spirit is revisiting us True and living, living in us Resistance is us That's why Rosa sat on that bus That's why we walk through Ferguson With our hands up When it goes down, we woman and man up They tell us stand down But we stand up Shots we on the ground and the camera panned up King pointed to the mountain top And we ran up like One day When the glory comes It would be ours It would be ours Oh, one day When the war is won We will be sure We will be sure Thank you to the National Civil Rights Museum. We appreciate you bringing us all here together tonight to celebrate Dr. King, to celebrate everybody who's marching for freedom today, who's marched for freedom in the past. This struggle has to continue. Sometimes it gets frustrating, I know. So many setbacks, so much backlash. So much disappointment. But I'm encouraged by everything I've seen tonight. I'm encouraged by the young people I saw this morning. I'm encouraged by Gloria. By half time. I'm encouraged to keep going. Can't give up. And one day when the glory comes, it will be ours. Oh, glory. Glory, when it starts, glory. red and dark.
Hopefully you enjoyed tonight. Thank you for joining us for this virtual tribute to Freedom Award. 2020 has been a lot, but we must go on. We must renew. We must reflect on the world and our lives in it. And we must recognize those men and women who put their lives in danger to make this world, this country, and our communities better, safer, more just, seeking freedom for us all. That's what Freedom Award is all about. And we're so glad you were with us as we pay tribute this year. Yes, not quite the way we do it every year, certainly not the way we wanted to do it. But as 2020 has taught us, we have to keep going. We have to keep pushing forward. Speaking of pushing forward, 2021 will be pivotal this year for the National Civil Rights Museum. It's a double anniversary, 30 years for the museum, 30 years for Freedom Award. And we want you with us for this journey. 2020 is almost done, and we look forward to 2021. 
Special thanks to our Freedom Keepers who kept us whole as we go through this pandemic.